Hello everybody. I hope all is well with you today. Annika is here to help us out with, would you believe it, here we are at lesson 10. We got one more after this and that's it. So I newly prepared this one. I mean, I, I did some cut and paste from older components, but overall I, I'm gonna, I'm willing to call it new. Let's talk a little bit about work and careers. Um, and obviously this is, this is one of the adjustment challenges we face. And I hope to dispel some myths, some rumors, and, and more than anything, I hope to help provide you with a couple more tools in your toolkit in trying to get to the bottom of what is it I'm going to do. And I know a lot of you are facing that. You're going to graduate in spring, and it's like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I'm going to have a degree. I got, I'm, I'm no closer to understanding what I'm going to do with my life, basically, than I was when I entered college. And I, I mean... That's uh, true of many of us, right? I mean, one of the reasons I'm in graduate school is when I graduated at Irvine with my degree in psychology, I'm like, uh, okay, so here I am, what, 42 years old, I've got a bachelor's degree in psychology, what the hell am I going to do? And of course for me it was, well, I'll go to grad school. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe some of you don't want to go that route. And really, kind of, that's just pushing off the inevitable, because sooner or later I'm going to have to work and, and doing what. So, you know, me, I chanced into teaching, and I'm really fortunate to have done so. But, uh, you know, uh, relying on luck is, and, and fate is probably not the best adjustment strategy there is, although it does represent an adjustment strategy. Uh, or maybe it doesn't. I don't know. What do you think, Annika? Well, so let's talk about job stress because, you know, fitting yourself to a job that, that is fulfilling, that allows you to become increasingly authentic, to self-actualize, what have you, uh, is going to diminish your stress to a certain extent. And, and we've already looked at this, but I, I love the model, and this comes to us from NIOSH, the National Institute of Safety and Health, of Occupational Safety and Health. So... Uh, to prevent the risk of injury or to minimize the risk of injury and or illness, we reduce our, our job stress. And, and I think one of the easiest ways to do that is go into a career that we're well uh, suited for. So there's a little, I've got a couple links here for you. Uh, there's the NIOSH Manual uh, of Analytic Methods, right? And this is a source of safety and wellness and the NIOSH Publication Index. So you can look at what our government provides us in terms of data. Coping with occupational hazards, right? Well, what do we know? Uh, what, it, what is kind of our, our, our legacy, especially in the United States? Uh, we got a longer work week, 48 hours on average. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't keep an hourly average on my work week, but I do know this that at this point in time, since my schedule is relatively flexible, uh, given COVID and not teaching on campus, I tend to work six days a week. Uh, I'll pick a day on the weekend usually not to do any work. It depends what kind of grading is afoot. But sometimes I'll take Friday off, sometimes I take Sunday off. But I, yeah, I'm probably working 40 hours a week, but I'm working six days a week, right? Uh, e even if it's just six hours a day, right? That would only be 36 hours, but that's only one day off. And I don't think that's necessarily suitable. So we work these insane long work weeks, right? Uh, Japanese worked about two and a half weeks a year less than we do, and Germans work nearly 12 and a half weeks less. And what is our purpose? What provides meaning? And if it's little more than work, uh, well, that's kind of a core component of a capitalist society, right? So. We often work rotating shifts, and this is this is devastatingly harmful. That's uh, I was introduced to that, well, at, at the paper mill. I mean, I worked for a private patrol company in my early 20s, uh, Foothill Patrol and Alarm in Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, Brentwood, Bel Air, uh, Hollywood, and I worked the graveyard shift, but I chose the graveyard shift. I, I liked doing the patrol work uh, from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. There was less traffic. Uh, the city is pretty at night, and I spent a lot of time up in the hills driving my patrol car around, keeping the neighborhood safe, if you will. But it wasn't rotating. I worked that shift all the time, so I was allowed to adapt to it. Think about the poor sons of bitches like at the paper mill. 
uh, the paper mill, you rotated shifts weekly, and, and that was devastating to one's health. And you look at guys who had been working at the paper mill for 40 years, right, and they look 20 years older than they actually were because every week they change to a new shift and they lose sleep as a result of it. Right? To the extent that we feel we have a lack of perceived control over what we do, this can be devastating. It robs us of autonomy, and, and this causes stress as well, and certainly doesn't allow us to self-actualize. Right? Uh, sexual harassment, and at the end of the lecture, I've got some th uh, four or five slides to talk about sexual harassment and uh, the consequences and, and what to do about it. Right? Discrimination and being the victim of discrimination and having a feeling of applying for a job, applying for a job, applying for a job, applying for a job, and continually getting turned down. And, and at some point you go, is this because I'm a woman? Is this because I'm a person of color that I'm being discriminated against in that regard? Crowding. The, the more that we're packed in, right, and, and many workplaces prior to COVID, and it's different now, you know, became cube farms that they uh, kicked us out of our offices and put us in cubicles. If anyone had come to my office uh, three or four years ago at Ohio State, we got a long office, right, it's long, and it's narrow, and there's six decks, desks along one wall, and, and what Ohio State was thinking, capacity, we could put six lecturers in there. And we had up to five lecturers in that office at one point in time. And you can imagine if we all had office hours at the same time, and we each had three students within that room, then we got five plus uh, five times three, that's, that's 20 people, right? All trying to communicate, all trying to get our work done, and, and that in creates stress in and of itself. And then dealing with evil managers and HR people, just one more source of stress. And no offense, you know I'm, I'm kidding there, but yes and no, I'm kidding. So these are the occupational hazards. These are the things we'd like to avoid. Uh, we may be forced to adjust to some of these, but let's, let's start thinking about in terms of what should I do? What, what work is suited to me? And there's a lot of models of career choice, Ginsburg, uh, Ginsburg, Gasparad, Herma, what vocational choice they described as an irreversible process. And, and clearly marked periods characterized by a series of compromises between wishes and possibilities. So we may have desires, but to the extent we can fulfill those desires usually represents some level of compromise. Now these developmental, and, and we go back to our childhood when we, when we look at this model, we enter into the fantasy period. We recognize that yes, we will probably have to work because everyone works, and so we start considering, well, and, and our teachers, you know, in, in grade school and grammar school will say, well, what do you want to be when you grow up, right? And this fantasy period, now, many of the choices that we make as, as children, right, are arbitrary. So, uh, you know, uh, my former colleague, <laughs> Carolyn, she watched the television show Chips, right? And, and in Chips, you got Ponch and John, or a California Highway Patrolman. And, and based on what she observed, which is completely an unreal portrayal of what it means to be a California Highway Patrolman, it's a television portrayal. She wanted to be a cop. She wanted to be, you know, a chippy. She wanted to go and, and be on the California Highway Patrol. Uh, kids my age, because I, I was a little older than, than Carolyn, one show that had a profound impact on us was like the quintessential police officers in Adam 12, Officer Reed and Officer Malloy. And many of us wanted to become LAPD officers because it looked like such an amazing profession as it was portrayed on TV. But by 10 or 12, we start looking and beginning to understand the reality. And, and so we start to transition out of the fantasy phase into the tentative phase. And children begin by asking themselves in this phase, what, what do they want to do? And, and the awareness of the abilities start to emerge. So as we move out of a Piagetian you know, point of view, concrete operations into formal operations, we begin to understand that we have certain skills and other things are not really within our skill set. Uh, at some point it became obvious, uh, well maybe as early as fourth grade, what, ten years old, uh, I, I knew that I was not going to become an artist. I, I could not paint, I could not draw, I could not do any of these things. Right? And I found this out by comparison with my peers. If you have an art project in fourth or fifth grade, you see some people do excellent artwork, most of us don't. And it kind of takes a career as an artist off the table, so to speak. 
So this awareness begins at this point. And, and then we begin to recognize that certain jobs are probably air quote, better than other jobs, right? That, that we think, wow, that's kind of a high status, high pay occupation or interesting or a lot of respect or exciting. And other occupations begin to little, look a little bit, uh, you know, mundane. And we go to the grocery store with, with one of our caregivers, with our dad or our mom, and we go to the grocery store and then we watch the checker and maybe we think, wow, would I want to stand on my feet all day at that cash register just punching numbers into it, right? Old school cash registers uh, that, that I grew up with. Or, or scanning items might even seem a little more uh, mindless than, than the old style uh, cashier. And we begin to think. And at this point, this stage ends at age 17 or 18. And we begin to realize, uh, like my first real job when I was 15, right, I went out and got my job at a fast food restaurant. It was an independent fast food restaurant, not one of the chains. Chains weren't really big at that point in time. It was an independent, and it, the, the work was hard as hell, and the hours were long as hell, and the pay was just unbelievably low. I mean, we're talking like a $1.35 or a $1.50 an hour, and, and working eight and 10 hour shifts sometimes, closing the restaurant. I had a pretty high level position of trust. I mean, it was just me and another kid working there, and I would I was the lead, right? After a couple of weeks, I was the lead. That's how <laughs> bad this job was. And and you know, one of my duties at the end of the night, besides cleaning everything up, was to take the money out of the cash register, right, and put it in the safe. That's that's pretty highfalutin responsibility in my book for a 15 year old. But it's do I want to spend the rest of my life doing this? And then I would look at the, the, the guy who ran the restaurants, and he owned two of them. And he owned one in Van Nuys, and he owned one in Reseda. And uh, he spent most of his time at the Reseda restaurant, you know. Uh, but is that what I want for myself? So you begin to become more realistic. That is, you're moving from tentative to realistic. And then for most of you, you're, you're hitting, you know, uh, that point where you look at, you're at the point of understanding what kind of, or, or, coming to terms with what you might like, what you might dislike, right? What abilities you have and, and where that might lead you. So you, you also then begin to consider, is this something that I would like to do for the rest of my life? Or maybe even you go a little higher level and you say, is this work consistent with my values, right? And, and in my 20s, I had a job that really made me question that. Uh, I decided I was going to sell burglar and fire alarms. And it was a pretty cool product for 1975, 1976, right around there. It was a wireless alarm. And this was unheard of. And so each sensor, and they were pretty big, they're about this big, but you put it next to a window, right? And if the window was open, then it communicated to the main base unit and set off the alarm and could also link up to the phone and, and call the police. Uh, it also had fire alarm capacity, but the thing is, I would go and I would have to cold call. I would make appointments with people, everyone I knew, right? Hey, can I borrow an hour or two of your time? And I'd do my sales presentation, but it centered around scaring people. Hey, look, this is the crimes that have occurred in the area in the last couple of weeks. This, these are the fires. Look, at this person died from smoke inhalation. And I'd have to sit there for an hour to try and scare people to create an interest in preventing this from happening to them. Would I want to do that the rest of my life? No, I wouldn't, right? It, it seemed to me, I felt I didn't feel good about myself doing it. I don't want to spend my time scaring people. Did it offer a real benefit, these alarms? Of course it did, right? And they functioned as suggested, right? But it just was not uh, the job for me. Right? And you begin to realize that. And many of you have probably experimented. Many of you have probably had several jobs at this point in your life. And it gives you an indication of what, do I want to do this or not? And, you know, you probably had entry-level positions. But if you look at your supervisors and you look at your managers and you say, is that what I want to become? And for many of us, it's not. And for many of us, we believe the college was the way out of that, so to speak. Now, 
the, the, the model of career choice, according to Donald Super, another model of career choice is, is that people pick a, a, a career that, that allows self-expression. So it's about implementing the self. And, and there's a lot to be said for this. Occupational identity does comprise a huge amount of self-concept, no two ways about it, especially in the United States. We're very much tied to what we do as an expression of self. And the growth stage is very similar to the previous model. That is, it's based on fantasy. But the exploration stage from 15 to 24, the stage I kind of just described, we're not committed to a career yet. We've had a couple jobs, likely. We're, we're in college, considering our options, uh, and, and we're still evaluating alternatives. Note that a huge number of people at Columbus State have kind of found themselves in this stage found that shit isn't working out, so they go to college, they go to Columbus State, that is as, as a ticket or a path out of uh, the kind of the scary future that they've now seen uh, could be for themselves. Now, the establishment stage, let's say we find a career, uh, it's a desire to become effective in a vocation, right? And, 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 but then changes that occur are within a, within a given occupation. So when I hit the paper mill, you know, in my late 30s, yeah, I was kind of a late bloomer. I had a bunch of other stuff going on before this. But, you know, it's, oh, so I'm at the paper mill, and I'm entry level. I come in as a forklift driver, and then I learn to drive a roll grab truck, and then I bid up to the packaging line, and then I start doing some trainings, etc. and then all of a sudden, and I make that transition from hourly to salaried as uh, you know the quality control assistant supervisor looking to become the tech rep. But notice that that's five jobs within a seven-year period at, at the paper mill. Uh, and of course, I decided that was not how I wanted to end my life, so I quit my job and went to school uh, and started essentially all over again. Right now, the maintenance stage. Clearly, this would be the stage that I'm in now. Right? So I've got, uh, this will be this fall, my 20th year of teaching at Ohio State, right? I've also been teaching at Ohio State for about seven or eight years, as, as consistent with that, right? Uh, the focus shifts from, from uh, improvement in job functioning to retaining the job, and I, I'm not sure that I agree with that necessarily, but that's the maintenance stage. That is, you want to retain the job, you do want to have the job until retirement, so you'll basically do what's necessary. And then the decline stage, you look towards retirement if you're fortunate to be able to do so, and, and your work-related activities begin to diminish, and, and eventually you move into retirement. That is, if the economy supports it, if your choices allow for it, if you put money away, right? Uh, when you go to Walmart, you see an awful lot of elderly people who are working. I mean, grandparent, great-grandparent age people who are working. And you say, would I want to do that? Do I want to be 72 years old and standing at the front door of Walmart? And I'm not putting these people down. That's not it at all. But what I'm asking you, is that something that you would want for yourself? And if it's not something you'd want for yourself, what are you going to do to make sure that you don't end up in that position? I would like to retire sometime. I don't want to work the rest of my life. I love you guys. I love teaching. There's other things out there, though, that I would like to do, right? And, and so, uh, and we have to face the idea that life is finite, right? And, and if it's finite, we don't have forever. So many of us want to retire and, mo and move on to other, other ideas. So, but now the the Holland model, and I imagine some of you have already taken the test, the Holland trait measurement and matching model, and it looks at these qualities in you to see which are, are dominant qualities and which are lesser qualities, and and the realistic, the investigative, the artistic, the social, enterprising, conventional, are all six dimensions on which the self that we can be measured on, right? And, and if you want to do the self-directed search, you can take the Holland Code test. There's a link. That'll get you there. And, and, and similar to this is like the strong interest inventory, general occupation themes, 
personal style scale the and, and what's your preferred work style learning environment leadership style engaging in in, in risk taking right so you can take these tests and, and they're supposed to direct you as to where you might be well is it most effective is it most happy is it where you might perform well and that becomes an iffy proposition right so uh, do, are, is, are these choices going to help you become more authentic or, or self-actualize uh, and, and these are good valid questions right now there's another way to look at this and, and that is we can look at the jobs themselves and we can look at what skills are necessary for this job right what qualities seem to support success in this career and I've given you a couple links here you can look at the dictionary of occupational titles and you'd be surprised how many jobs there are that you've never even heard of or thought exist so it's a great way to look hey what's out there what's available what might and, and then but then there's the occupational outlook handbook because who wants to move into a career that's dying right that doesn't necessarily represent a, a good future uh, what do you think? Do you, what do you think about as we come out of COVID, and let's say we have maybe two years, a year and a half, two years of COVID. Let's face it, we're, we're going to be at a year of COVID here sooner rather than later. Uh, and we've gone to online instruction. What do you think? Do you think that that is going to change kind of the face of education in the future? And the, I mean, online education has been growing. Is this really going to kick it in the butt? I mean, it, are, are we looking at, you know, kind of the the deterioration or or the downfall of the uh, in the classroom model are we going to look at universities as basically ghost towns somewhere down the road i mean certainly research activities would likely be conducted in laboratories etc but will the university model survive this perhaps perhaps not right hard to know well, it's important to know what the future looks like and what predictions are. Now, one of my favorite sites, and if you take personnel psychology with me in the spring, you will be spending some time at this site, uh, is ONET. And, and, you know, we often talk about the government, how inefficient and how horrible the government is and how the government can't seem to do anything. Well, I'm going to hold up ONET as a website, uh, a government-maintained uh, website, that is a real tremendous contribution to understanding the workplace. So ONET has every job, every occupation you can imagine listed. And not only that, when you start clicking on the jobs, it'll tell you the knowledge, skills, and abilities and other qualities that make one suited for the job. So you can kind of work backwards and you can say, wow, I could do this job. I've got that. I've got, a, I've got that. I've got that. It can tell you a, a tremendous amount of information about what's required to do a job. It also tells you pay rates, ranges, and averages. Okay? It also predicts the future longevity of that career. And some jobs are labeled as hot right? and, and, and growth jobs. Others, not so much. So I'm a big fan of ONET. And guess what ONET also does? ONET has quizzes built into it. So you can go into ONET and you can kind of take these quizzes and it can point you in directions of positions that might be compatible to your style and your current abilities, knowledge, and skills. Now, a website that's becoming one of my faves, right? Well, there's just two websites here. So you've got the, the, the help guide or a healthy living, finding the right career. And that's one place you can go to help kind of shed some light on the doubt you may be experiencing in your current position. But one of my favorite websites is becoming 80,000hours.org, right? And, and this link takes you to the portion of the website that's about the career guide and the personal fit. And, and 80,000 hours is also really kind of keyed to occupations that might appeal to a lot of you, occupations that provide some meaning and provide a contribution to our future. So there's always kind of that angle to it, and that I think is what kind of makes it special. Do you want to just do something to make money, or do you want to do something to have an impact on your environment, or impact on culture, or an impact on the less fortunate, right? So it's, it's more about finding meaningful employment, if you will. So what do we know? Well, 
the formula, and I took this from 80,000 hours, so the capital, the career capital is your skills, your connections, and your credentials. So this is kind of what you bring to the employment party, right? Impact is something that you assess. To what extent is, is, is pressing the pressing problem or, or engaging in the right method important to you? And then supportive conditions. What do you look for? Do you want engaging work? Do you need a good rapport a relationship with your colleagues? What are your basic needs? Uh, the fit with the rest of your life or lifestyle, right? Now, these all combine. You add these together. This is the additive part of them all. But then I love that 80,000 hours says the most important aspect to this, though, is you and your personal fit. And that's why this number is multiplied because it gives it increasingly math, uh, it gives it increased mathematical power in this equation, the person fit. Now, let's get back to the person fit. We looked at various models and various quizzes to look at your styles, right? What do we know? Let's look at the data. And this is from a Schmidt and Hunter uh, meta-analysis. And what do we see? And this is important for those of you who want to take personnel psychology. Hey, let's take a Holland-type match test. So I was just talking about the Holland test. How predictive of it is your performance on the job? Like, not at all. So why these tests persist is because we like to take tests and we like to put ourselves in categories or boxes, but it's not predictive, right? Now, integrity tests do a pretty good job, uh, job trial procedure, but notice these are really kind of personnel tests. And if you take personnel psychology, I'm going to really focus on uh, understanding what we want to use in the personnel selection process. So we're going to come back here to 80,000 hours in the next slide. Hang on, we need to go to part two.